sorry if I'm not good at this public speaking thing. I'm scared to death by my dog. <laughs> Just kidding. I love this thing. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Levi Atkins. I'm a native of Tennessee, born and raised. Uh, what's up? You're from Georgia, but well, all right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, actually quite a bit, so bear with me. I'm sorry if I may have told you today that you smell like mothballs. <laughs> I'm sorry for my obnoxious behavior every day, and I'm sorry that you have to put up with it. I'm sorry that my shoes aren't dress shoes. But I'm not sorry about what I'm about to say. <clears throat> a few months ago, I was employed at Walmart as a car pusher. Are you familiar with that job description? Yes. Yeah. I take your buggies that you leave next to cars, and I take them back to the store. You're all guilty. <laughs> Although, meanwhile, I had my applications in at various church camps, I was looking past that. In fact, one of the camps that I was trying to get on with rejected me just one day before I was to do volunteer work for them. Not saying that they were wrong for that, just saying my focus was shifting off working for a church camp. A couple months ago, I was offered a raise and a promotion, and to me, this is God saying, no church camp, stay where you are. That is my God for us. <laughs> that wasn't any problem for me. In my mind, the simple things can be the better. I was looking forward to saving my money and potentially going to school. About the next day after my promotion offer, I got an email from a church camp based in, I wrote here Santa Fe, New Mexico, because I wrote this quite a bit ago, Glorieta, New Mexico. They said that they heard about me through a camp called Fuge, and uh, they wanted me to put in my application with them. So I said, you know what? What the heck? Why not? And in fact, this is the most casual way I ever filled out an application. True story, this is true. I'm sure Hap could probably tell you this if he has it on file. Somewhere in the application, I wrote the acronym L O L. <laughs> not even a lie. I did not care because I didn't think anything was coming of it. I got rejected by all the camps. So I was like, why not? The next day, they said they wanted to interview me, which led to the longest job interview I ever had. And eventually, they offered me a position. We all know God works in mysterious ways, and I was very aware of that fact in that moment. I've had quite a bit of time, or I've had quite a bit of time from my interview to when they'd actually offer me positions and they asked me to pray about it. Unfortunately, between those times, I had been, I hadn't been as spiritual as I'd like to have been. I was working the 4 p.m. to 1 a.m. shift, and what I knew was my Bible time was decreasing, and I wasn't happy about that. And I'm not saying don't do something because it makes you unhappy. That's life sometimes. So one night I was doing some intense Bible study and came to the revelation, the comfortable life isn't for me. Can you repeat that with me? The comfortable life isn't for me. And you all are familiar with that because you've been working here for a month. <laughs> and none of you have been comfortable one time. <laughs> but I'll get to what that means specifically later. I had two weeks left with Walmart, but I felt very led to give up that extra paycheck. By my central base of Texas, if you have a Bible, you can turn there right now. It's Luke 9, 57, 62. Sometimes in life, no. A lot of times in life, you're going to need to burn your comfort bridges and start working. And I'm, through the Holy Spirit, going to show you how that's done. So again, if you have your Bible, if you have your phone, anything, let's get a Bible. Let's look off somebody's shoulder. Let's scoot over 50 seats and look at someone else. Let's get to a Bible right now. Luke 9, 57 through 62. I'll be in the Holman Christian Standard Bible, but it doesn't matter which version you're in as long as it's not the message. <laughs> so give me a thumbs up once you're there. I'm not reading until everyone has a thumbs up. Awesome. 
not sweepy floors, not even the lack of a roof. It's God's wrath. And the possibility that he might have faced it. We know of the wrath that will be poured out on the world when the brothers and sisters will be raptured up. We won't have to face that. Amen. To no credit of our own, but to Jesus that provides such a life, who's offering the same to the lost souls today. The same ones that are coming up for King. To live as Christ and to die as gain. So avoid that wrath that has been poured out onto the earth, for that is the scariest of all. You may very well still be scared from this knowledge, or you may not be. I, I remember a 13-year-old me reading Revelation front to back with fear and confusion never leaving me. Which is funny because if you read upon when Jesus, I think specifically the Sermon of the Mount, or the Sermon at the Mount, not of the Mount, the Sermon at the Mount, the people were confused and scared. So that's what I was like reading Revelation comes back. Fear and confusion never leaving me. And it led to this popular frame of thought in American Christian society. There's no need to go so far. Say that with me again. There's no need to go so far. When I first started reading the Bible, my go-to gospel was Matthew. The first book I read in full was Matthew, indeed. And just like anything else I had read in the Bible, guess what? It scared me to death. But specifically speaking, there was, a t there was one day, I was in the seventh grade at school, and for whatever reason we had free time. But it was the lousy kind where you sat in silence and read a book. So they had this mobile bookshelf, and every time I saw the shelf, the book that always caught my eye was the student Bible. I didn't have one of my own, or at least one that wasn't King James, but I was intrigued. So I picked it up, and I went to my go-to gospel, and eventually I came across these famous words. And if you have your Bible, which you should, or you should be looking up with someone else, please turn to Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9. And I will wait. And we will have a thumbs up. Cool. Yes, ma'am. That is Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 and 9. Matthew chapter 18, verse 8 and 9. If your hand or foot causes your downfall, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life, maimed or lame, than to have two hands or two feet be thrown into eternal fire. And if your eye causes your downfall, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye rather than to have two eyes and be thrown into hellfire. Throughout the duration of my Christian life, if I've ever expressed to someone that I sin, I've never received the response of, Well, Levi, maybe you should gouge out your eyes. Never! In fact, going back to the vivid day I read Matthew, I also remember going to my grandmother and saying, are we really supposed to do this? Yeah. For real? And, of course, everyone chimed in with, Ah, there's context to it. No! Although I would agree that a lot of scriptures need searching for context, I strongly believe Jesus meant exactly what he said right here, 100%, no questions asked. In fact, that's factual. If you look in the Greek, the Hebrew, it says it's very literal. He wants you to cut your limbs off if it causes your downfall. But if you don't believe me, let me give you an example of what I like to call context search. When I took classes in Dyersburg, Tennessee, at the West Tennessee Bible Institute, it was a very interesting experience because these people were King James only. Nothing wrong with the King James, but I'm not going to limit myself to the King James. So one night I was studying and I was like, you know what, I'm going to take three translations. I took the New International Version, which they hate. And if you're King James Version, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I took New International, Holy Christian Standard, and the King James. And to give you an example, 
I will give you one verse from John, chapter 3, verse 7, to see if you learn anything. Holman Christian Standard says, Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. English Standard Version, Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. New English Translation, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must all be born from above. And the King James Version, Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Did I teach you something? It's easy to see that Jesus was singing out Nicodemus and telling him that he must be born again. You did careless thinking. But when we read translations, different translations, we can see that Jesus saith unto him, Ye must be born again, you all. To quote John 3.16, For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But now when we look at Matthew 18, verses 8 and 9, it's a different story. Jesus is singling you out. He's being literal, literal about what he's talking about, and he's frankly letting you know that if something is that big of a distraction to you, you need to sever it from your being. Whether that's the television that shows something you shouldn't be looking at, sever it! And by George, if your own arm is the origin of your sin, and it's that bad, sever it! There is an apparent context you need to search for, especially with this passage, especially with the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm not saying if you sin today, cut your own arm off. But then again, I'm not, I'm not saying it either. <laughs> but I know there's some of you sticklers out there who's wanting to know about the law and that that doesn't really apply to us. So let me teach you a thing or two about the law. We are under the preconceived notion that if we follow the law to the best of our abilities, then we'll probably have a good seat in heaven. That if I just maintain the Ten Commandments, I'll be okay. I know I'll never be able to keep the whole law, but I'll take whatever reward Jesus has for me in heaven. I'll take a back seat. What if I were to tell you that doesn't work? If I may be so bold, would you allow me to tell you that the law, especially the Ten Commandments, aren't applicable to born-again believers? Well, it's true. And it's not that it's a flawed living system. It's the opposite. It's absolutely perfect. The flaw is us. We aren't capable of upholding it. But I'm a Christian. I can uphold it. Because I can walk longer and farther than the sinners. My initial retort to that would be, no one is good. There's not even one. But trust me when I say that all who rely on observing the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now it is clear no one is justified before God by the law, because the righteous one will live by faith. Hey. I know this seems completely ridiculous, that the law, especially the Ten Commandments, are a life guide. They help us get right with God. In fact, Jesus himself said, do not assume that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy these things, but to, blah, 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 but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all things are accomplished. We're dead to the law, right? You guys are hopeful. <laughs> to illustrate better what exactly this means, the definition of dead reads, as an adjective, no longer alive, as an adverb, absolutely and completely. The law, as born-again believers, has no bearing on us, born-again believers. Why would you trust a dead entity to guide you in any way, especially when it comes to your life? Let me repeat that. Why would you trust a dead entity to guide you? 
any way, especially when it comes to your life. If the law is your life, if the law is your life's guide, guess what? You're doing it wrong. W R O M G. We're not called to worship the law, man. We are free from the bondage it brings on our lives. We serve it in absolutely no way. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us. So that we may serve in the new way of the spirit and not the old letter of the law. Christ is the end of the law. Amen. Come on, man. He won. For Christ has already accomplished the purpose for which the law was given. As a result, all who believe in him are made right with God. We're made right. He won. Amen. It's not if we follow certain rules every day that will make us right with God. It has everything to do with the accomplishment of Christ. We say every day, God, we're not cool, but you are. And in our hearts, if we mean that, if we mean that, man, it's not about rules. It's about the day true love died. And if you're still not grasping the seriousness of this, sacrificing the goodness that comes with it, James 2.10 says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one, one point, he is guilty. Is that encouraging you to follow the Big Ten or any of the other law? So I want to close with this. And I'm sorry if I've gone over, over my allotted 20 minutes. Please forgive me, brother. I shudder to think where I'd be without the old book. I'd be a sinner of the theft, adulterer, sexually immoral, and all the others variety. But God picked up this lost soul. Along the way, he's told me what to stray to and away from. And sometimes I didn't listen. Let me be frank, I didn't listen. It's just being real. But thanks and praise to the one who forgets sin. Remembers no. Just so long as I have a repenting heart. He carried my cross and yours up to Calvary to put God's wrath, the same intended for us, and it was put on his son, so unjust that he turned away. He couldn't even look at what his just son didn't deserve. Why? All this took place out of love. None of this exists without the origin of love. And it kind of brings a new meaning to that word, love. We love because he first loved us. He's always been. He's always been present. So love in turn has always been. But it's only when we fix our eyes on all that God is that we may know what love is. And I pray that you do so that through your missionary endeavors, you'll find that perfect love cast it out of all fear. So please, right now, would you bow your heads and close your eyes for me? And as I'm going to pray for you guys, I'm going to come up and play one more song. <laughs> so right now, this is just, this is just you and God right now. No. Reflect on the week. Reflect on anything that you may have gotten out of this message. Just those thoughts. <laughs>